In the years since I asked this Congress to raise the minimum wage, five states have passed laws to raise theirs. Many businesses have done it on their own. To every mayor, governor, state legislator in America, I say, you don't have to wait for Congress to act. Americans will support you if you take this on. 29 states in the District of Columbia now have minimum wages higher than the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. This week, the Los Angeles City Council voted 14 to 1 to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which will be phased in over five years. One study estimated that nearly 50% of the city's workforce earns less than $15 an hour. Los Angeles is the third U.S. city to approve a $15 an hour minimum wage. Seattle and San Francisco's increase increases are already in effect and will reach $15 an hour in 2018. Joining us now, economist Jared Bernstein, a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and an MSNBC analyst, and two members of the Los Angeles City Council here in Los Angeles, Paul Krikorian and Karen Price, who is chairman of the Economic Development Committee for the LA City Council. Uh, gentlemen, how hard a fight was this? When I see a vote of 14 to 1, it feels like all you were arguing over was how big an increase should it be. Well, actually you know, we had months and months and months of debate and discussion. Uh, we had uh, four studies. Uh, we had uh, several uh, community meetings. Uh, heard from hundreds of constituents, and business owners, uh, and our colleagues, of course, on the council. So it was a very well discussed, uh, vetted uh, issue. Certainly, one that's uh, critically important, not only to uh, Los Angeles, but uh, we think nationally. Uh, income disparity, poverty is a gigantic issue in Los Angeles. And having an opportunity to raise the minimum wage of hardworking men and women uh, was very significant. So, I, and let me just add that you know, the, the, the vast majority of those persons are, are individuals of color and, and women. And so it's really lifting up uh, those who are at the bottom. And so what did the studies tell you about what would happen to jobs? Well, you know, one of the important things about the process that the council went th through was to do it methodically, to do it uh, thoughtfully. And uh, as the chairman said, we, we have these economic reports that show that um, around the edges, there may be some adverse impacts uh, on some jobs. That's why we're taking a go slow approach. Mm -hmm. But the important you're thing is... raising it about $1.25 a year uh, uh, yes, over, uh, over about, that period of time. Uh, yeah. about. But we get to $15 in five years for mm -hmm. large employers, a year after that for smaller employers. That gives businesses enough time to be able to adjust so that you won't have significant job loss. Uh, they can change their business models. They can change pricing structures and so on. Uh, so we'll maximize the benefit for the working poor while we're minimizing the adverse impacts to, to businesses. Now, the, the, the phrase so, uh, job loss here is, is a little peculiar because what you'd probably have is job migration. Uh, it, it's more, isn't it more likely so that Lawrence, someone might just move the, the business over to Glendale and, and so the person doesn't actually lose their job? So let me well, speak be, to that if be, I might. Could, could, okay, Jared, uh, go ahead. Yeah, let me speak to that. If I might. You said something very important earlier in the discussion uh, that states, uh, 29 states in the District of Columbia, and something like 15 cities have uh, adopted uh, higher minimum wages, uh, in, uh, and, and in some cases equally high as the one we're talking about today, as you mentioned in Seattle and San Francisco. So we don't really have to speculate all that much about some of these impacts, at least based on what we've seen so far. And what we've seen is precisely what the uh, council members are telling you, that this is a policy that has its intended effects of raising the pay of some of our workers who really need those raises. I mean, it used to be the case that you could say, well, these are kids from uh, uh, moderate income families. Uh, clearly, that's not the case anymore. These are oftentimes adults, uh, full-time workers, people with families. And we really haven't seen the kind of displacement where businesses move out of uh, a particular district in order to avoid the minimum wage in many cases because they need to be near their customers. Right. And, and we, we, we think that uh, history has shown that in fact, uh, higher wages means uh, more productivity, mm -hmm. uh, it means less turnover, and so uh, there's some benefit uh, and to the employer as well. ultimately, as you cycle through it all, more tax revenue to Los Angeles. Uh, uh, Lawrence, there's going to be $6 billion a year coming into the pockets of Los Angeles workers and being spent in mm -hmm. the regional economy. Uh, Low-wage workers don't take vacations to, the Bermu to Bermuda, they don't invest in the stock market, they don't 
squirrel their money away in sort they of bank spend accounts. It and they, they spend, spend it, here. it in mm -hmm. local businesses, especially in small businesses in the area. So there will be a positive mitigating effect on the economy that will, uh, I think, be at least as great as any right. potential now, didn't, job didn't migration. Didn't you also vote to uh, actually peg this to inflation in the future? So well, we you'll, did. you'll have automatic increases. Mm -hmm. It in kicks in uh, in the 2020. Uh, the uh, uh, CPI will kick in to uh, regulate it on a on a predictable basis, mm -hmm. and you know the council can still has the liberty of taking uh, action to speed up, uh, reduce, uh, so or continue. Jared, if, go if ahead. I may, Lawrence, if I may, you know what I really like about this example and this movement is that we're taking a, a, a national public policy problem, one that you and I have discussed on this show before, which is uh, not just this broad issue of income inequality, but the fact that so little of the economy's growth have reached people of, at the bottom. And through community activism and a democratic process with members of the council that you have sitting with you tonight, you're actually seeing people do something about it, something real, something tangible, something that has uh, a support across much of the nation. Uh, so I, I think this is endemic of a, of a very positive trend. And what? we hope it'll be a trend, Lawrence, and that's the important part. We're taking a risk here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, but we think it's a bold and uh, a bold move that we hope that the rest of the country will soon follow. We hope and, Congress and, and is listening in every state And what economists love you for is you're using a really big laboratory. Los well, Angeles <laughs> is the biggest laboratory to it try is. this yet, and so it's going to generate an awful lot of new scholarship and, and understanding about how and, this and, works. You know, and Lawrence, it's just the right thing to do. It's the, mm -hmm. This is the moral imperative of, of, our, of our time. And, uh, you know, you know, for people to have to work two or three or four jobs to make ends meet, uh, have to decide whether they're going to buy uh, groceries or, or get the car fixed or get shoes or, or get a prescription, uh, they shouldn't have to make it's, those kinds of choices. It, it, so. it's, it's demo democracy, it, de democracy at work uh, for the benefit of low-income people, it's not something we see enough of these days. All right, that's going to have to be the last word on it tonight. Jared Bernstein, Councilman Karen Price, and Councilman Paul Krikorian, thank you all for joining me tonight. Thank you. Lord. Thank you. Up thank next. You.